So we were um, talking about graphs, and we finished our initial definitions of graphs, right? Um, and we did not get as far as the as the students in, uh, in in the Monday Wednesday lecture. So we're going to go over. Um, but I went over enough to show you guys that basically how to use the, uh, the video. I'm uh, sorry, how to use the um, what should I call it? The library, right? Um, for your assignment. And um, you may have noticed. Let's see. And I think we didn't get really into the chant. How much did we get into implementing the graph data structure, right? I talked about adjacency lists and adjacency matrix, right? I mentioned about those, right? So. To review that point, um, where we left off since it has been a week, so you've got two different types of ways to implement a graph, um, and, and your and our program in um, you know and the programming language, sorry, in the uh, library you use will probably use one of these two approaches either. Well, I can get two new markers into this right out. Look, it's called folding markers. So that's fantastic. Two. These markers are all dried out. Why do they bother leaving them? Um, let's do this one. And try that. No, this one. Okay. So we have the adjacency list, and the adjacency list, uh, as you might um, gather, is generally means that we keep a list of e of all the items that an array, that basically a uh, a node has. So typically. I would store my adjacency list as a map, but you could but you could store it as a list. Uh, I'd store it as a map just so I could look up each node individually. But it might look like this, where if I've got A, B, C, and D as my nodes, right? And let me generate. Um, so I've got A going to B, C going to B, C going to A. Um, and B going to D. Um, now this kind of graph is called a directic, a directed acyclic graph, um, or a DAG. So uh, that sounds like a lot of big words. So let's break it down. Directed acyclic graph. Okay, so. That's just, again, it's just uh, mathematicians using fancy uh, sounding words to intimidate you. So we know what a graph is. So there we go. No need to worry about that word. We know what a directed graph means. It means it has arrows, right? So that means that, you, that these edges are only one row. Uh, acyclic, though. So let's forget about the A part and just focus on cyclic. Cyclic means, would, would imply that this thing has a cycle, right? So acyclic means what? Not, not, not one cycle. Yeah, it doesn't have a cycle. So a directed acyclic graph means a directed graph without a cycle. So if you notice, this one has no cycles in it. Basically, you can only, if you, if you move in the edges, you're eventually going to get to start somewhere and move along the edges, and you're eventually going to get to D. Right? There's no cycle. There's no way to get it back around. Um, now, there's a nice big class of problems for directed acyclic graphs, um, which we'll get into in more detail when we talk about topological sorting, um, which I hope to get to today. Um, but um, let's go ahead and get back on track, which is what this looks like in an adjacency uh, list. Adjacency list, that if these are all key values in a, in a list, sorry, in a uh, map, A. Uh, it connects to node to just node B. B connects to node D. So B connects to right the list of the its adjacency list is uh, D. Uh, C its adjacency list is A and B. Right, and uh, D doesn't connect to anybody. It doesn't connect to anybody, so it's got an empty list as its adjacency list. Okay, so nothing too scary there. Okay, an adjacency matrix. So this is one way to represent this. This is just one map with the keys being the nodes and the values being the list 
of all the nodes that it's connected to. Um, the other way we can store a graph is the adjacency matrix, which is a 2D array where, uh, and its size is, is, is you know, uh, V. In other words, the number of uh, vertices, so it's a V by V array. So we, so we essentially have uh, each row is the source and each column is the destination. So A, B, C, and D. So in a, in a unweighted graph like this one, we can uh, use either true or false to represent the presence of an edge, but it's typically better to use a one if there's an edge and a zero if there's not an edge. So for instance, there's an edge between between A going to B, so we put a one here, There's and A doesn't go anywhere else. Uh, B goes to D, C goes to A and B, and D doesn't go anywhere. Right? And it is legal for a, for a node to have an edge like this, right? Um, so we'd like to use ones and zeros here because uh, if you've got if you've got a 2D array full of one zeros, the mathematician is going to go and look at that and go, oh, that's a matrix. I might be able to do some some matrix multiplication or some uh, something like that, and you know, shake out a very interesting uh, answer or an algorithm. And so that's kind of a useful thing for that. What if, on the other hand, that this is not an, uh, this is a weighted graph, like we have numbers here. All right, so we want to put so it costs uh, five to get from A to B, uh, two to get from C to A, zero, and one, okay? So um, in this case, we'd replace uh, A to B would be replaced with five. Okay. Um, B to D would be replaced with, well, stay, stay the same as one. C to A would be replaced with two, but C to B, if we were, well, we replace that with zero, obviously, but now we're left with a bunch of zeros also representing there's no edge, right? And that's a bit of a problem, using zero to represent no edge in a weighted graph, because in a weighted graph, it's perfectly valid to have a, for an edge to have a weight of zero, right? Zero meaning that it doesn't cost anything to go from one node to another. Um, so we need something other than zero to represent that there's not an edge there. Um, and so what we're going to use instead is that we're instead we're going to use positive infinity uh, for the value in a weighted graph um, to say you know to say basically there's no edge there. Um, it works better than having to do a bunch of null checks and. It does, and it indicates to the user basically the same kind of information, which is that, oh yeah, sure, you can get from C to D directly, if you, you know, but it, but the amount of effort it will take to get there is infinite, right? It, there, there's, there's always more, you know, you can't really get there because you can't pay enough. So, um, so that's the way we would do adjacency uh, matrices. Um, so one or zeros if un, if we use an unweighted graph, and then in a weighted graph we would do uh, double up positive infinity for the presence of no edge, and otherwise um, one if there isn't it, uh, you know, the value of the weight. Um, now this is for directed, so that's what we do. Now these are this, we've just been covering directed graphs here for undirected graphs in adjacency matrices because. Directed gra uh, undirected graphs are symmetric, right? It would have a symmetric matrix, right? So if this was undirected, C to B would imply that would imply B to C, right? Uh, we can actually just store half of the uh, the array, the uh, lower triangular portion of the ma matrix. So here's two examples um, of unweighted ones. So ones they just put ones for for the values that are going to be there, and then 1.0 is for uh, here, and notice that basically that it's symmetric for for the unweighted graph. So we would only need to store the lower. We would only really need to store this in an unweighted graph. Um, 
So one of the questions that will be on the final will be, uh, it will be given a matrix, you know, please draw my graph. Um, so they go on on how they implement their graph, which uses really just integers, so I don't bother using that. Um, so how do we compare these implementations? Yeah, it's got two implementations, right? Which one do we want to use? Um, and believe it or not, the time efficiency really doesn't change too much between them. I mean, some of them it's better, but the main thing that we're going to be looking at is space. That's the main point at which we, we do stuff. Um, so what we're going to be talking about is the density of the graph. It's the ratio of the edges to the number of vertices squared. In other words, uh, so in other, so uh, we have two, basically a uh, graph is either going to be sparse or it's going to be dense. A dense uh, graph means, means that basically the number of edges, that's closer to the number of vertices squared. In other words, basically for, well, let's look at this uh, matrix that I drew on the board. Um, in a simple graph, in other words, graphs where you can only have one edge between any two nodes, this is basic. This matrix basically gives you all 16 combinations of source pair of source destination pairs, right? A dense graph would basically be almost all the way filled up. Basically, there'd be an edge between pretty much uh, from every source to every destination. In a sparse graph, there's basically a you know that's closer to the uh, basically being the number of edges are equal to the number of vertices. You know, this is you know. And uh, is this sparse or dense? Well, that really depends. Well, this really isn't that big of a graph, so it doesn't. I mean, you could argue <coughs> either way. Um, so the so essentially, we're going to say that basically that uh, the number of edges is v squared in a dense graph, or closer to the, or so. In other words, every vertice has about v edges coming off of it. Or in a sparse graph, basically every vertice has about one edge. So most algorithms that we haven't gone over yet, not directly, they look like this. Um, for every uh, vertex in the graph, um, look at all of its neighbors. That's what it's saying. So it always gets into this annoying UV kind of thing, and that really is terrible if you're handwriting it uh, because your handwriting is that. But I like to say, uh, but that's because mathematicians did this. For every uh, vertex in the graph, for every uh, neighbor adjacent to that vertex, vertex, uh, do something with the edge from uh, the node you're looking at to the uh, neighbor. So uh, this outer for loop, you run it once for every vertice. And the inner for loop runs uh, once for every edge connected to that vertice. So in other words, this our algorithm goes over the, this algorithm basically runs once for every edge in the graph. So this algorithm is equal to uh, the number of edges. So in an adjacency matrix, um, right? What do, how would that work? Well, in order to find out if an edge exists, I'd have to iterate through that row. So basically, for e, for this node, uh, is A a neighbor of A? No. Is B a neighbor of A? Yes, it is. So check this one, that one, and so you'd have to iterate through the entire row. So for each of the B elements, it would take B time to iterate through. Uh, so it takes V squared. So that's great on a dense graph where you're already looking at V squared number of edges. But if it's a sparse graph, you'd, you're better off using an adjacency matrix, sorry, adjacency uh, list instead. Let's see, so yeah, which basically runs, you know, the number of, you know, it only checks the elements that are in the list. Um, so generally, if the graph is dense, you want to use an adjacency matrix. If the graph is sparse, you want to choose an adjacency list. Uh, a sparse graph basically means that you've got a bunch of positive infinities or zeros in your matrix if you're using a matrix. So they they, they would just take up they just take up space. Like look at you've got 12 infinities in this just taking up space. Um, so if you um, the other Thing to consider though that's easy that's much more intuitive is the uh, amount of storage space right for an adjacency list uh, the amount what's the amount of space wasted well with the adjacency list you have uh, basically for each node you will have a list so you have 
basically for you you have a reference. So that, that takes up space not only for the data but also for the references. And if you're using a map, of course, you're, you're wasting space so you can get very fast lookup time. Um, so we can use, so that will take up a lot of space. On the other hand, an adjacency matrix, it will waste space with, if it's sparse, right? Because each of these will uh, represents basically a null node, whereas this represents a non-null node. So, um, so basically, you for for storing nodes it, in sparse graphs, you're going to use up a lot less space if you use an adjacency list, and in dense graphs, you're going to want to use an adjacency matrix. Okay, same thing for storage. So, question is, what is the cutoff point? Well, we can skip all the mathematical stuff and just get to a straight off the cutoff point, which is around 25%. Uh, if it's less than 25% full, you want to use a list. If it's uh, greater than 25% full, use an adjacency matrix. Um, mind you, for the size of graphs you're going to be working with, it's not really going to matter too much. So, um, but if you're working in a graph that's got hundreds of hundreds of nodes, you might want to, you know, deal with that. Um, so traversing, uh, so now we're going to go over basically the big algorithms for uh, going through a graph. Um, breadth first, first, sorry, breadth first search, depth first search, and then Dijkstra's algorithm for the shortest path. Uh, once that's done, I my other goal before moving on to other algorithms is uh, to teach you topological sort because that's what we're going to focus my last homework on. Dijkstra's and topological sort are the, la are the focus of the last homework, so, um, or homeworks, depending on how they're given out. So, um, so you will have already gone over depth first search and breadth first search, um, not necessarily just because I gave you a homework on it. Um, they're pretty simple algorithms, which is why I feel like you're more than capable of handling them, even if I'm not, go even if I hadn't gone over them now, but also because, uh, You've already done them in the maze assignment. In the maze assignment, we already did depth first search and breadth first search as part of the maze. You solved depth first search. Sorry, a depth first search in order to go through the maze, and you solved. Um, and my example was a breadth first search. So what are these? Well, they're algorithms that you adapt to your needs, but they always use the same strategy. Um, and essentially, it is that we what we do is that we start at a, some point in the matrix. Sorry, in our graph and go through it in some kind of uh, deliberate order. So breadth first search means searching the neighbors of the neighbor, you know, searching the neighbors, then the neighbors of the neighbors, then the neighbors of the neighbors of the neighbors, and so on and so forth. And depth first search means choose a hallway, go deep as, you know, deep through that hallway as you can, and then back up once you hit a dead end, right? Those are the basic rundown. Now, the, interestingly enough, we're going to essentially write them the same exact way. The only difference is that breadth first search, we're going to use a, we're, we're going to use a Q and DQ, um, and add and DQ from this queue. And for depth first search, we're going to push and pop from stack instead. The, the otherwise, the algorithms are going to be exactly the same. Um, I mean, depth first search, as just to note, depth first search can be written and is typically writ written recursively, but honestly, it's easier to teach if you just say stack and queue. Uh, so breadth first search. The way breadth first search works is that you kind of look at um, um, and I'm then once this I explain this, I'm going to go on a side of like some applications of searching problems that you can just look at yourself right now. Uh, so breadth first search is essentially you can you start at some starting point. Well, I'll typically label uh, label my starting node S. You know, um, the first thing we do is that we search, we we look through our uh, neighbors. And then we look at our neighbors' names. What are we looking for? Um, that really, again, just depends on your thing. You might be looking for a specific, uh, you might be looking for a specific node. You might be looking for um, a, a list of nodes to see if they're in the graph. You might just be wanting to find out what all the, you might just want to explore the graph and find out what all interesting things are in it. It really just depends. But what breath first search says, it, but what breath first search uh, describes is the met method which you're going through. So here I'm looking at so 
We start off by looking at the neighbors. Next, we go on to the neighbors of the neighbors. And now we've got we've expanded to the neighbors of the neighbors of the neighbors. So three sets away. Right? See how all the nodes I'm touching are three sets away? Right? So this is a so that's kind of a breath first search. Um, so what kind of other problem? So what kind of like things can you do with this traversals? Um, has anybody here played like six degrees to Kevin Bacon? Yeah, that's a graph problem. Uh, so for those of you who don't know, don't know what that is, Kevin Bacon is a prolific actor. Okay, starred in a lot of stuff. And uh, there's a joke that basically, uh, sorry, and there's kind of a uh, a score called for actors called the Bacon number, where that's basically your distance to Kevin Bacon. So in other words, if you've acted in a movie with Kevin Bacon, your Bacon number is one. If you've acted with somebody who's got a, who's acted in a movie with Kevin Bacon, you've got a Bacon number of two. If you've acted with somebody who's got a Bacon number of two, your Bacon number is three. If you've acted with somebody who's got a Bacon number of n, your Bacon number is n plus one. Uh, mathematicians have something similar called your Erdos number. If you published a paper with Paul Erdos, who was a very prolific mathematician, you've got it. You, uh, you've got an Erdos number of one. If you publish somebody who's got an Erdos number of one, you've got an Erdos number of two. I've got an Erdos number of five. So I published with somebody who, uh, I believe my advisor had an Erdos number of four, which is why I was able to end up getting that. So it was, um, and, and there's a website that keeps track of that stuff. Other type of graph problem is um, Wikipedia is the Wikipedia chase. So essentially, um, let's see, Wikipedia, I don't know why I'm typing in all case. Uh, chase. So, no, okay, let's see if I just go over game. Explore and race through Wikipedia. So there's, a t essentially, you uh, start a random article and try to get between another article, right? The idea is here, like, you want to get from one game to, an basically, the game is starting from this one article on Wikipedia. Um, get to another article on Wikipedia by clicking on the links, right? And, but this is a graph problem, essentially. You're going, you're, you know, with each, uh, with each article being a node on the graph and each, uh, thing, and each uh, edge being basically a one-way, that's a, and sorry, and each link is a directed edge from one article to another one. So that's a graph problem. Um, and in fact, basically the, uh, let's see, Wikipedia, uh, philosophy. So let's go ahead and talk. Yeah. So Wikipedia. So X for so basically add um give me a Wikipedia topic. Turtles. Turtles. Turtles, Turtles goes to turtle reptile fact reality competition semiotics action philosophy. So essentially what this entire thing does shows that we can, it builds a graph by clicking on the first link of everything. Turtle goes to turtles, goes to reptiles, goes to tetrapod, goes to superclass, class, taxonomy, science, knowledge, uh, fact, reality. Essentially, it builds a lit, a graph, and it terminates once it hits philosophy. Uh, so, uh, recursion. Recursion hits linguistics, which goes to language, communication, meaning, semiotics. Uh, let's see. Anyone else? This is, this is kind of the idea here is that everything leads to philosophy. Uh, yeah. Chair. That's actually interesting. Chair, furniture, decorative arts, interior arts, art, design, human behavior, life, physical uh, body. Let's see, and that gave us a completely new branch. Chair leads to life, which leads to, to physical body. So, um, but this is, but see how this is a graph problem. It's just simply clicking on the first link on each article. Right, so chair, right, if we look at the chair Wikipedia page, chair is a piece of furniture, and they click on furniture, movable object, let's see, and I, let's see, decorative art, so it ignores parentheticals, so it ignores anything that's in a parenthesis. Uh, decorative art, uh, then it goes to interior design, then building, and so on and so, you know, uh, and so on and so forth. I must have missed something to get into buildings. Oh, did I miss art? Oh, yes, I missed art. I missed art, so and then went to human activities, which uh, let's see. Oh, human behavior, which went to human, which uh, extant taxon. 
interesting. So anyway, but this is a fun program that somebody wrote, and it's a graph. It is unmistakably a graph, right? Um, so it is, you know, it's a pretty cool, it's, it's just an application. And this is, that's essentially a, um, and essentially this is just doing a def first search until it hits it, right? It's just simply choosing the first link. And then if it doesn't hit philosophy, and gets, it, it gets into a loop somewhere, and then it will record that loop. Like I think World War Two. I think that that uh, oh nope that that's that gets in there now. I remember there was some kind of war related article where it got into a loop. So, um, but yeah, that's a graph problem. All right. So let's go over. So let's go over a few examples of breadth first search, which is one of the algorithms that we would use. So breadth first search is useful if you're looking for basically something in the neighbors and neighbors and neighbors, right? Um, so the first thing you want to do is you I, uh, you identify a starting node. They're going to use zero. I'm going to use s. And essentially, they're going to keep two sets of uh, like three data structures. Uh, one is a list of all the things they visited. Uh, they use colors to do that. I'm going to use a set because I don't want to imply that my node might need to, might have need to have a color variable. I'm just going to keep a set and basically say that's my scene set. Then you're also going to have a queue for basically what to visit next, and then you have an out, and then the visit order is an output. So the colors are going to be a set, and they differentiate between visited and identified. In other words, have I gone through it yet, and have I uh, seen it? So we start at zero. So zero's neighbors are one and three. So we throw them into the queue. Now it doesn't necessarily matter what order we're throwing them into, right? But for this, but this example will assume that we throw stuff into the queue in, in numeric order. In other words, we don't throw it in 3-1, we throw it in 1-3. So we visited 0, and we looked at 0's neighbors, which are 1 and 3. So we're done with that one. So now to get, we move on to our next node, which is, which well, we look at our queue for it, so that's 1. We, we pop up 1. Uh, sorry, we remove 1 from the queue. And now we look at one's neighbors. So one's neighbors are zero, but we've already seen it yet, so we don't bother adding it to the queue. Right? We started there. It wouldn't make sense to go back there. Uh, then four, six, two, and seven are the other neighbors of one. So I'll put them in, in, in numeric order, so two, four, six, seven. And I also mark them as seen. Okay? And I throw them into the queue. And so I'm done with one. So I move on to the next <coughs> one, which is three, which was a... Which was, uh, which was in, you know, just like one, it was right next to, to zero. So now we look at three's neighbors, uh, zero and two, but we've already seen them, right? We've either already visited there or they're already in our queue. We've already identified it. So in that case, there's nothing new to add to our queue, so we're done visiting three. So now let's move on. So now we go to the next item in the queue, that's two. Its neighbors are one, three, which you've already visited and 8 and 9, which we haven't, so we throw those into the queue. So note, now just notice how now we're starting on the distance 2 uh, away from 0. So 1 and 3 were 1 away. Now 2, 4, 6, and 7 are all 2 steps away, and then 8 and 9, and then eventually 5 are going to be 3 steps away. So we're at 4. So look, so let's see, we're at 2. We identified eight and nine. We move on to four. Uh, four's only unidentified neighbor is five, and the rest of the stuff we've already seen. So next we move on to six. Six has nothing new to offer us. Seven has nothing new to offer us. Then we move on to eight. Eight has nothing new to offer us. Nine has nothing new to offer us. And five has nothing new to offer us. Now that our queue is empty, we are done. So everybody understand the last steps. Basically, we would just go through all the nodes and see what we what was there and what wasn't what was visited and what was all was not visited so breath for search the algorithm is pretty, pretty straightforward take an arbitrary start vertex so you can either uh, in your algorithm breath for search you can either take in a node as the starting location as an argument or you can take in as an or you can just take in the graph it's by itself so take in the graph and a node or just a graph by itself if you take in the graph by itself, you've got to choose what node you're going to start at randomly. Um, and then the way to do that in Jung is to uh, 
is to turn your is to you know get the set of all vert of all vertices in your graph to then turn that set into an array and then grab index zero from that array and you chosen one quote unquote at random. Um, but anyway, you, you mark it identified. For us, that's going to be putting it into a set, and we place it into the queue. While the queue is not empty, uh, remove the first vertice from the queue and visit it, and then for everything else, then for all the adjacent nodes, if it's not been identified, you've found it now, now put it in your queue, and then you're done visiting. Um, the order which you visit stuff can actually produce a tree kind of a walkthrough from your starting location to all the other locations. Uh, and that has two useful things. First is that it like produces this, you know, path, the, this list, series of paths for you. But it also gives you the shortest path from, or or shortest paths rather, from uh, from one note, from any note, from the starting node to all, all the other nodes. Yes? That tree would depend on what person you visit. Right. That tree would depend on the person you visit. So, and also what order you decide to visit and stuff here, right? So zero, there's nothing that would have stopped me from from going to three first and it, uh, after zero, and that would have produced a radically different tree. Um, how long does this take? Well, it runs once for every edge, essentially. Well, it runs twice for every edge if it's an undirected graph. Uh, it will in an undirected graph it will run once for you know each edge as we discover each new uh, new node. And then it will run once when we check to see have we already seen this edge before. So it essentially runs twice for every edge, but it's equal to the number of edges in the graph. So that's O of E time to do breadth per search. Okay. Def, um, so I'm going to go ahead and just go over like um, another example on the board for that. So I'm just going to draw um, something using our. Um, so let's go with uh, A, B, C, D, and then E, and F. Okay. So we will. I'm going and I'm going to list my data. The data structures I'm going to use here. So I'm going to use. Uh, Essentially, two days, uh, three data structures, or three variables rather. I'm going to use a set, um, which I'm going to call seen. So this will basically be the nodes I've already seen. Uh, you know, so I've either identified them or visited them. I'm not really going to make the distinction. Then I've got my queue, which I'm going to keep. You know, which I'm going to use to figure out what my next item is. And then I've got my um, output, which is could be. A list of all the nodes in the order I visit them, which will essentially be in the same order as which I see them. So, uh, but it really depends on what again what you're thinking. So I'm going to start from node S. So now the algorithm starts. So DQ from our queue, okay, and look at my neighbors. So S's neighbors are A and B. I have not seen uh, A and I've not seen B. So I add them to C and then I add them to our queue. Okay. And done. So now I DQ my next item. So that's A. I've seen S, but I haven't seen B, so I'm going to add that to the queue and to what I've seen. Okay. And now I'm done visiting A. So now I uh, DQ and visit D. Now let's look at D's neighbors. I've seen D, I've seen S, and I've seen B. So I'm, so I'm done visiting B. Uh, next, I DQ and I visit B. B's neighbors are A and B, which I've seen, but also C, which I haven't. Okay. Now I DQ C. Uh, C's neighbors are E and F. So now I haven't seen them yet, but now I have. So now I add them to my queue. And then E and F, I'll, I'll DQ E. I haven't seen any neighbors of E. Oh, so I've seen all of the neighbors of E. Oh, I forgot to add C there. Okay. And then I DQ F, um, who I've already seen all the neighbors for. All right, so um, what about breadth for search? Uh, so, so that was breadth for search. What about depth for search? Depth for search, it uses a, um, it, it, it works like this. Start a vertex, visit it, then choose one adjacent vertex and visit that one, and that, and then visit one adjacent to that until you had a dead end. A dead end being defined basically you can't go anywhere 
uh, new. So you go backwards after that. So here's how that one works. You've got, we start at node zero again, and then we're going to visit our, uh, we're going to choose one neighbor that we haven't seen yet. So zero, we haven't seen one yet. And then going from one, we haven't seen three yet, so we're going to go visit three. Sorry, we haven't seen three or four, we're going to choose to visit three next and go there. Then from three, we have, you know, three places we could go, zero, one, and four, but the only one I haven't been to yet is four, so I go there. So went to zero, to one, to three, to four. It went in numeric order. There's no reason it has to go in numeric order, though. Okay? So now at four, we're at a dead end. So here, what I'm going to do is that I would pop, that is that I pop off there, then I pop off, uh, so, I, then, so I go back to three. Uh, then I go to three and pop that off. Then I go to back to one and back up. Then I go back to zero and, well, at zero, I have a new choice. I, I can go somewhere new from zero. I can go to two, and from two, I can either go to five to six, or five or six, I'll go to five, and then from five, I'll go to six, and then I'm in a dead end again, at which point I'll pop off six, I'll pop off five, I'll pop off two, and then I'll pop, and then I can't go anywhere else, I'll pop off zero. So there's two orders, essentially, for defer search, and this is why I say the output can vary, um, and what you're, what you're using it for can vary. The, we can first basically go with the order that we visited stuff in, or we can output the order we, you know, we finished stuff in, the output in which stuff uh, got popped off, the order in which we hit dead ends. Um, so we can also use, uh, we can also basically create another like tree-like structure here. So here's all the edges in the graph with the ones that we popped off being, um, you know, full edges and the ones we didn't travel, we call back edges, which are the ones that are in dashes. So it gives us another way to yet another way to organize our graph. Okay, so um, let's go. Oh, so here's essentially the algorithm from that. Um, take the current vertex, mark it visited, and enter it into the discovery order list. Then for every vertex that's uh, adjacent to the current vertice, if you've not visited that ver uh, that adjacent that neighbor, uh, then set your parent. Of, of that vertice to set the parent of the neighbor to where you're at. In other words, you know, mark this as where you're coming from. I'm not going to do that in my algorithm because I'm going to be using the stack, but sometimes that's what you want to do in a, in a search. You want to know how you got to that node, as we'll see in Dijkstra's. <coughs> and that really, again, just depends on the algorithm and the application of the algorithm. Then, recursive, then just recursively do this algorithm. I'm going to use the stack, so I'm not going to bother with recursion. So, um, again, this one will, um, what this will do is that we will, uh, again, run, this is going to run equal to the number of edges. Again, it's V plus E here because there's an implicit step that we mark everything as unvisited, but um, I mean, it's, um, what we're going to essentially do here is that we are going to uh, show you that it's not too different than our algorithm. All we're going to do is change out the uh, stack for Q for defer search. Sorry for defer search. So here, we're going to use a stack. Um, okay, so I'm going to start at S again, and then I'm going to choose either A or D. Let's go ahead and go through. Uh, go choose uh, D to begin with. So. Start at S, right? I start at S. Um, and what I'm going to do is that I'm going to uh, push D onto the top of, uh, I haven't seen, so I've, so I've got two neighbors, A and D, I'm going to choose D. So I mark D as seen, and I put D on top of the stack. Now I peek at the top of the stack to decide where I'm going to go next. Uh, so I'm at D, peek at the top of the stack to know where I am. I look and find out I'm at D, so what are D's neighbors? Well, these neighbors are S, which I've seen, but B, which I haven't. Okay, so I'm going to go uh, to B. And then from B, I could either go to A or C. I'm going to decide to go to uh, C, actually. And then from C, I can go to E or F. Uh, I'm going to go to E. Okay, so now I'm at E. I can't actually uh, go anywhere from that. 
So I'm at the dead end, so I'm going to pop out E and put it on, on in my finish order. Okay, from, so I'm back at C. Where can I visit uh, from C that I haven't visited before? Well, I've seen E, haven't seen F though, so I'm going to go there. And then F, we do the same thing. It's a dead end, so we pop F off. Then we can't go anywhere from C, so we pop C off. Then we can't go anywhere, so now we're at B again. Uh, we can go somewhere new for B. I think I put F up there. We can go somewhere new for B. We can go to A. We put A on top of the stack. And then we're at a dead end. So we pop. And then we're at a dead end for B, so we pop. Dead end for D, so we pop. And a dead end for S. We pop. The stack is empty. We're done exploring the graph. Now we did this in the maze. This is the algorithm you had to use to solve the maze. Um, so you've kind of already written this one once. Um, it just looked a bit different because um, we weren't when, because the graph I was working on was like a grid. So they weren't explicit. There wasn't anything I called nodes or edges. Um, you know, we just had essentially. Let's see, it's loading up right now. Um, we had a grid. And I had basically, there was either a wall or there wasn't a wall, right? So recent teaching time. So, right, it was made up of cells and the cells either had walls, right, or they didn't. And essentially, if something didn't have a wall, there was an edge between, you know, if it didn't have a west wall, there was an edge between this cell, which was a node, and the cell to the left of it, if this was at the false. So it was uh, basically kind of the reverse way of thinking of it, but it was useful for, for the pur purposes of creating a maze and understanding it. And this is how, and this did depth research, right? It went down this corridor essentially until it hit a dead end, and then it backed up and found a new corridor and went down this one until it had a dead end and then backed up, went down this one, dead end, back up, right? Dead end, back up. Well, dead end, dead end, dead end, dead end, back up again, dead end here. So then it backed up all the way and then went down this corridor again and backed up over to here to move on to the next location, right? It was just doing, this is depth research. This is the algorithm I described. You can also use depth research to generate a maze as well, as I talked about in, um, when we were going over it. So like, um, right, maze generation, Maze generation algorithm. Oh, come on. Seriously? You hate it when you get Wi-Fi issues on campus. I don't know what it what it is. Okay. Um, right. So here's depth for or something generating with depth for search. And unlike the algorithm I used, which was a very basic algorithm, right? It runs into it chooses corridors randomly until it heads a dead end, and then it has to back up and find a new and create new corridors. Um, this one creates essentially a very long and windy passages, right? That's what this one does. So uh, this one creates very long and windy passages. Um, so um, now let's go on to the uh, now the other the big the next the big algorithm for graphs um, which is uh, Dijkstra's algorithm I'm gonna skip over the slides and come back to them so these all happen to do with uh, unweighted graphs right but um, to a lot of problems we use we do we go over weighted graphs and you know stuff we can do with weighted graphs uh, typically this is around the lines of basically uh, here's a bunch of cities here's the connections between the cities and how much it costs Go from one city to another. Find me the shortest path from from city A to city uh, N. You know, so that's the so that's the kind of algorithm. You can see how it has real, real world implications there. Uh, basically, finding the cheapest cost. Um, so we're going to learn Dijkstra's algorithm. Dijkstra's algorithm. The hardest part about it really is this actually spell Dijkstra's correctly. Um, but um, is a very prolific computer scientist. Uh, he. Uh, you know, this algorithm is essentially, you know, it's named after him because he created it in the 50s. Uh, and then it's gotten further refined over the years. What we're going to learn is the original Dijkstra's algorithm that uses 
essentially sets and um, and arrays to do this. Um, well, I'm going to use maps, but they've also but the way they but there's better implementations that are quicker that get left to another to the algorithms class. You will learn Dijkstra's multiple times. Uh, pretty much any time graphs are introduced. I learned it in algorithms. I learned it in data structures. I learned it in networking. Uh, because you know, because that's something that routers had to perform. Um, so, right. So let's just give an example of this kind of idea for Dijkstra's L. Okay. So the idea here is for Dijkstra's is that if I start at node S and I want to find the cheapest route to F. Right, but now my nodes have a, um, you know, a weight. Right, what is the cheapest route from uh, S to F? And right, we could we could totally just compute every single possible route from S to F. Uh, Right, and that's probably the way you'd prob probably do it. So two, you know, four here, eight, sixteen. Can we be beat sixteen if we go this route? Yes, we can. Don't want to go take that route though because it's more expensive, right? But what if we go this way? Where we go? One, two, three, four, five, six. That certainly seems like the cheapest route to get there, right? Um, so Dijkstra's algorithm has one. So here's the only caveat, and this is the most appropriate place to bring it up. Uh, Dijkstra's algorithm has one failing and really one failing only, um, which is essentially it doesn't deal with negative uh, numbers very well. Some graphs, there's a negative cost. You gain something as you go. So let's go ahead and change this to this one route to negative three. So now the question is, what is the shortest route from S to F? Same question. What's the shortest route? Right, so you go. So you've got one, two, three, four, with a cost of minus three there. So you are saying your cost is uh, is one, right? Yeah. I can do better. In fact, any route you present, I can do one better. Always, guaranteed. So now, if now do you, so anybody, so hopefully that gives you an idea of what the problem is. I can always do one better than your shortest route now. Yes? So you can repeatedly go A, B, A, B. I can, re, yeah, I can repeatedly, if I, yeah, even if it was directed, though, I could do this, too, even if it was directed like this. I could, yeah, but you're exactly correct, uh, all right. I could go A, B, A, B, A, B. And just rack up a negative value until I got some some kind of approximation of negative infinity. That is the cheapest route. Um, I mean, because remember, you're gaining something here. In fact, basically, if you're looking at like if you're if you're writing an algorithm that's trying to exploit currency trading, this is the kind of thing you're looking for. Essentially, you're trying to look at conversion rates that basically that if you go through if you go to yen to Canadian dollars to uh, to the British pound to back to the American dollar. If you do that cycle, right, maybe you can make a cent or two, uh, you know, per dollar that you started with, right? You could get a one percent gain, right? And so your algorithm needs to scan for that and immediately exploit it as soon as you see it, and then not get and then immediately cut it off because the trick with the trick with those kind of systems is that you're immediately feeding the system too with all of your buy and sell orders, so. Uh, that's something to keep, you know, keep in mind. That um, that we're dealing with systems that aren't going to be uh, impacted by you uh, deciding what you're, you know, to take, you know, to take a route on there. Okay. So um, so to do, perform Dijkstra's algorithms, we need a couple of terribly named uh, uh, variables. They're terribly named because Dijkstra was coming from the mathematical background where they use only one letter for each variable, right? So he has S, V, S, okay, so maybe he used a couple letters, uh, D, and, and P, 
Uh, when I write them on the board, they'll actually have better names. Um, so S is the set of all vertices that you figured out the shortest distance to. So what Dijkstra's algorithm is going to do is not just going to give you the shortest distance from S to F. It's actually going to be the shortest distance from S to all the other nodes. Um, this is actually the only way I can really ascertain that this is the shortest distance, by figuring out the shortest distance to all the nodes to get to F. And then, uh, you know, kind of building up from that answers. Uh, so S is the stuff I have, I, I'm done with. VS is to do, which is what I'll name my variables when I actually like write this on the board. Uh, D, V is a is a array of all the shortest distances to that vertice. And P is the predecessor. In other words, how I, uh, how I got to this node. Right? So it makes more sense when we run through the algorithm. And it makes more sense to run through the algorithm to, than to try to explain the algorithm to you. But it's very intuitive once you understand it. The idea here is that we start out at, um, we're going to start out at index, sorry, at node 0, like normal. Um, it takes no effort to get to, to get to here, right? Because I am here. Right, so I so we initialize by saying basically that we put s in the first vertice in the first we put s in here we put vs all the other nodes in vs. Here's the list of all the other nodes. This is the distance to that node, the current shortest distance that I figured out to this node, and this is how I got there. Okay, so initially it looks like this where I've got just nodes, I've got node zero as my starting point and you know, I'm, I figured out the shortest distance to get to zero, which is the stay put. And then I, all the stuff I still have to figure out the distance to, that's nodes one through four. Okay, so now let's initialize our data set. So no, from node S's perspective, essentially, uh, where do I, what distances do I know? I know I can get from zero to one at a cost of 10. Right? I know that I can get from zero to three for a cost of 30, and I know I can get some zero to four for a cost of 100. These are the sh shortest distances I know so far. Yes? Um, we don't care where we're going. We're just trying to figure out what the shortest distance is to everything, essentially. That's what Dijkstra's does. So it depends on, on what you're doing, but Dijkstra's is the shortest distance period to a location. Uh, sorry, to, from, from a location to anywhere. So yeah, it's a good question. Um, node 2, we don't have a direct edge to. So we're just going to put down, it's going to take infinite distance to get there, right? Because we haven't, that's that's as good as we got right now. We don't have a direct route from zero to two. Okay, so now, right, because all we can see is what we're connected to, which is node zero. So now uh, we set, we said, how do we get to node one? Well, we got there through zero. How do we get to node two? Well, we got there through zero at a cost of infinity. Uh, how do we get to node three? Well, we can get there through, by going through zero at a cost of 30, and how can I get to node 4? I can get there through 0 by going, by, by sorry, at a cost of 100. Okay, so now this is, so that was the initialization step of the algorithm. Now the way the algorithm works is that we look for the, for the node in the stuff we still have to compute the shortest distance to. Um, we look for the one that actually has the shortest distance. So 1, we figured out the shortest distance to, right? Of these nodes, 10 is the smallest, right? So we figured out the shortest distance to that, and you can verify that for yourself. So now we're going to use, now that now that we know the shortest distance for 1, and we've confirmed that it's the shortest distance for 1, we're going to see if, by, if going through 1 gives us any additional information on how to get somewhere. So going from 1, so it costs 10 to get to 1, and if I go, uh, and there's an edge 1 to 2. So if I go through 1, it costs me 10, and then uh, to go from 1 to 2, that's 50. So in other words, the distance that it takes to get to 1 plus the distance to get to 2, that's a total cost of 60. So the question is, is 60 less than infinity? Yes, it is. So what I'm going to do is that I'm going to update 2 with, uh, with 60 and say I got there, got to 2 at a cost of 60 by going through 1. Okay. So, in other words, if the distance uh, from the node I'm current, uh, from S to uh, the node I'm looking at, plus the distance from the node I'm looking at to one of its neighbors is smaller than the distance I currently have down, then I update it to that value. So I look at the neighbor. If I can get there for, if, if the cost to get to me plus the cost to get to my neighbor is cheaper than what I know to get to the neighbor, put it down as the new way to get to the neighbor. Okay, 
So we're done with, uh, we, we've looked at all the adjacent edges to one, so now we go and look at the adjacent edges to two. So, oh, sorry, we look at the adjacent, we, we look, we figure out what our next uh, node to look at is. So we look at the one that has the shortest, uh, the shortest distance for the ones we haven't done yet. So 60 is the shortest, 30 is the shortest, 30 is the shortest, so it was node three. So let's look at the node, at the edges coming out of node three. Okay, uh, it costs 30 to get to three, and then 20 more to get to two. That's 50. Is 50 less than 60? It is. So now we update node two with a cost of 50 and say we can get there by going through three. Similarly for four, for node four, we look at the co cost to get to three is uh, 30, um, and 30, and then three to four is 60. So we say 30 plus 60, right? And we're getting the, and we get the 30 from the table. Cost to get to, uh, to there is 90, which is less than 100. So we update saying that the cheapest way to get the four is by go, that we know of now is to go through three. So now we're done looking at node three. So now we look at 50 versus six. Uh, we look at what node we're going to use next. 50 versus 90. Well, 50 smaller, so we figured out the smallest distance to two. So we're going to go from there. Um, so now it costs 50 to get to node two, right? We don't we don't actually count 30 plus 20. It takes 30 plus 20 to get to two. That's already in the table. We say we just simply go and say it costs 50 to get to two, right? Because that's what it says in our table. We get there by going through three. Okay. So now the question is. Uh, Let's look at the outgoing edges of two. How do I, so the outgoing edge is two to four. Okay, so that's 10 plus 50, which is uh, 60. Is 60 less than 90? It is, so we update uh, that value um, and set the predecessor to two. Now if, we, if that had not, now if we had had a bigger value here, say that this edge cost was 100, we just wouldn't update the value. Right, this the example has basically every single time we check, we update. So um, so we update it with 90, and we get to 90 by going through 2. Okay, so we're done with there, and we're left with only one node in our to-do, and by definition, that one's not going to give us any more information, so we're done. So we're finished. So we know that the cheapest way to get to 1 costs 10, and we go by starting at 0. The cheapest way to get through to node 2 is to go through three, um, and that will cost you 50. Well, how do I get to three? Well, let's look at three's table. Well, you get to three by going through zero. To get to four, that will cost you 60, and you'll have to go through two. To go to two, to get, to how do you get to two? Well, you go to three. How do you get to three? Well, you go to zero. Yes? I will give you, on the final, on almost the way uh, Dijkstra's algorithm almost always works is given a graph, um, for, you know, produce the table, produce the table, and uh, to, and if the professor rem remembers, they say, oh, and you know, please, you know, put the steps or you know at which things are updated, or they'll say stop when you hit this node, you know, right? So we'll still tell you to stop midway through rather than do the entire algorithm because. You know, if we told you to do the entire algorithm, you could, you know, do it without actually doing Dijkstra's algorithm. So, Dijkstra's algorithm is as follows. Um, you've got the initialization step, and then you've got the algorithm itself. So, initialize, done, with the start vertice, and to do, yes, with all the remaining vertices. For all the nodes in, to do, in, the, in your to-do set, uh, set the predecessor of that node to the starting vertice. If there's an edge between those nodes, you know, use that weight. Otherwise, set the weight. Uh, use the distance. Set the distance to infinity. Then, while your uh, to-do set is not empty, look at all the nodes in your to-do set. Find the small one with the small uh, with the shortest distance. Uh, remove it and add it to your done set. And then look at all the nodes adjacent to it. If the cost to get to the, to the node you're looking at plus the weight to get to its neighbor is less than the distance to get to that neighbor, update uh, update that weight and update the way you got there. Um, this algorithm, it will take uh, 
O of v squared times u is the way I've described it because essentially you're looking at all the nodes, right? So this first step, it, we're just going through everything. And then we've got a loop. So this loop goes through all the nodes, right? For all nodes in, in, the, set, in the to do set. So that's actually all the nodes except for the start node. Then we got to look at all the nodes in the to do set, which is all the nodes with the start nodes, and find the one with the shortest distance. So we find the shortest distance, uh, n to you know, v times, and we run that v times. So it's v times v, so it's v squared. So if you use some kind of heat there, though, you might you'll be able to get the the, um, the runtime down. All right. So um, let's go ahead and uh, draw this on the board. <coughs> This is definitely so. This is definitely another question that, that occurs on the exam. Okay, so let's go ahead and draw um, some much more manageable set of diagrams on the board. I'm going to actually use draw my table first. So we've got our vertices here, and then we've got our distance to that vertice, which I'll just simply use as an array. Sorry, I don't like ellipses. Slightly shorter. Vertice, your distance to the vertice, and then your predecessor. S, A, B, C, D. So we've got five vertices here. Okay, then we've got uh, done and to do. Okay. So those are our four data structures that we need to uh, to do this. And let's go ahead and draw a graph so we can have an example. We've got S as our starting node. And I'm going to do this on a directed graph. Uh, so S to A to B, C, D, Um, and there we go. So let's see what our shortest distance is to get to everywhere. So let's go ahead and put some values down. Uh, one, five, two, uh, seven, one, six. Eight, four. Okay. So sorry if that's hard to see in the back, uh, but let's go ahead. So we start. So we're going to start from S as our starting node. So we're going to say it's done and put the other ones into do A, B, C, and D. Okay. So now we initialize our set. So don't really need any information about S, right? Um, A. So what does it take to get to A currently from S? Uh, cost one to get to A, five to get to C, and then two to get to D, infinite to get to, to B, and the predecessor for all these are, is our starting node. Okay, so now we start our algorithm. Which one uh, out of two do? Which of the two do's do we need? Do we use the one with the shortest distance? That is A. Right, A has the shortest distance. That, that we, we, know, we know the shortest distance to A, that's the smallest one, so we're going to use A. So now we look at A and look at the outgoing edges of A. Uh, the outgoing edge of A is A to B, and that's 8. So is 8 plus 1, 9, is that cheaper than we, what we currently know how to get to B? Yes, it is, so I'll simply put 9 here instead, and I'll say the way we got there was through A. Okay, now we look through these node, these this list of nodes, and see which one of these uh, is do we still need to do, and of those, which is the shortest. Um, and we find out that two is the next one to use. Done A. Now we're moving B to done. So the outgoing edge is from uh, from D. What did I say? B D. Okay. 
the outgoing edges of, B, of D are D to C, D to A, and D to B. So let's go with D to C is 2, so is 2 plus 1 less than uh, 5. Yes, it is. So put 3 here and update with D. Um, 6 to A, so is 2 plus 6, which is 8, is that less than 1? No, it's not, so we leave that, that edge B. Uh, D to B, uh, so that's 2 plus 4. Is 6, short, is, is six less than, uh, than 9? Yes, it is, so update that to 6. And say we can get there by going through D for cheaper. Okay, so we're done with that one. Now we've got 3 and 6. So I'll remove um, I'll, I'll remove C and move that to done. So let's look at C's outgoing edge. 7 to get to A. So is 7 plus 3. Is 10 smaller than 1? No, it's not, so it doesn't update. Yes? So when you consider the C, it, I assume that it's already done in previous screen, so consider the fact that I... Sorry? Um, when you so you're considering C, right? Yes. Do you still need to compare the value to I that I is already in the done? Uh, yeah, you do because you, because you're looking at the edge and um, so if I mean you've already figured it's not going to change the result because A is already done. So you could skip it in theory. Okay. Um, if A is already done, you could skip it in theory. But the way the algorithm runs is that you check. It just goes ahead and check checks. But it could it could never be. Yeah. Correct. Unless it was a negative edge, in which case that might, that will change the algorithm entirely, right? Which is why I say it doesn't Dijkstra doesn't work on negative edges. <coughs> so now B is, is the last remaining node and has no outgoing edges, so it's not going to do anything. So this is our shortest path on how to get there. So I think we're going to go ahead and it's 6:40, so I think we can take a short break uh, here, and then we'll come back. I'll do another example, and then we'll move on to last algorithm I feel like I have to teach you. Um, so. Sure.